Hi, this is the video for lesson 9, K-6 lesson for February 17th, 2013. The fall of Jericho is recorded in the book of Joshua. Some of the key points right away. God's judgment is on those who despise his grace. So, strong law in this section. The people of Jericho had rejected uh, the good news of salvation, and so God's judgment was upon them. And gospel section of that God guards and guides his people, and you see very strongly in this lesson that his hand is with them, and what happens when God is on your side. Some of the storytelling items. The city of Jericho was tightly shut up against any invader. This is a city that was very well fortified. Uh, the walls were very, very thick. Uh, people inside those walls, the soldiers, were very well trained. Jericho was... Not a city that was normally messed with, but reports of Israel's greatness and the fact that God was with them had intimidated the people of Jericho quite a bit. So they were just prepared to sit inside their city and defend against any attack that Israel could muster against them. God gives Joshua some very specific instructions as to how they are to take the city. And it seems kind of odd to us at first glance the things that he has Israel do. He instructs Joshua to lead Israel around the city for seven days. He says, after you walk around the city for seven days, it will fall. So for six days, the whole Israelite force marched around the city one time while blowing their trumpets. So the entire army is marching around, around the city. It's marching, blowing their trumpets. Other than that, they are completely silent. There's no yelling. There's no engaging the people of Jericho, just silence and trumpets. And so you can imagine how that tension would have been created. Imagine, you know, a good thing to do would be to paint a picture of what it was like for the people inside Jericho to watch for six days as this army doesn't attack, but they just walk around the outside of your city once, not doing anything, not saying anything, just blowing trumpets. That would be, in my mind, very creepy. And at, by the sixth day that this happened, I think I would be kind of on edge. Like, are they going to do anything? Is, is this all that there is? Uh, finally, on the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times. And on the seventh lap, that's finally when they broke their si silence, everyone shouted, and the walls fell, and the people rushed forward to take the city. So this was obviously the work of God. It had nothing to do with them shouting. It just went exactly as God had planned it. Right at the beginning, he told Joshua, seven days, I'm going to bring this city down for you. And it went exactly the way that he planned. So between this event with God bringing the walls of Jericho down, possibly thick walls, between that and crossing the River Jordan, which was their lesson last Sunday, as God piles up the waters of the Jordan, between those two things, they had absolutely every reason to trust God. So as they're moving forward, uh, ready to conquer the rest of the land, they have absolute confidence. And you see that in the, the rest of the book of Joshua. As they're moving forward and attacking the other cities, they are attacking as a group of people that know they are going to win. And it's not because they're amazing fighters or anything like that. They were going to win because God was on their side, giving them victory. Uh, after the, the city was ransacked, uh, I guess I should say during um, this ransacking of the city, Joshua commanded that Rahab, the prostitute, be spared her life. Uh, she was the one that when the Israelites were sneaking into Jericho to spy on things and see how to attack it and everything like that, she had actually hidden the Israelite soldiers from their enemies. And so when it comes time to you know, take the city completely, Joshua says that her life should be spared. That ends up being a really neat part of the story because Rahab, a former prostitute, marries into the nation of Israel and eventually becomes part of the line of our Savior. She's in the line of Jesus Christ, one of his direct human ancestors. And it tells you about the people that God chose to be a part of his plan. No, it's not people that are perfect and not people that are super holy. No, God makes us holy. We are just a bunch of sinners that have the privilege of being God's children, have the privilege and the blessing of doing the work of his church. It's kind of incredible when you take a step back and think about it. Some of the teaching items. Chapter 6 makes it clear that the land of Canaan is entirely a gift from the hands of God. 
and I think I mentioned this in last week's video, but think about how they felt when they sent those 12 spies into the promised land, and the 10 of them came back and said, we can't do it. These people are gigantic. They're going to destroy us. And now, you go from that point to now, where they are so confident, and they know the change has been because God is showing them, I will give you this land. This is the land I promised you, and I'm going to give it into your hands. Uh, God gave Israel a chance at Jericho to exercise their faith. You know, he doesn't tell them to go and attack right away. So there would be no no thought in their mind that this is somehow, we are a great nation, we've taken taken this city. And also he tells them that they're not to take any of these the, the plunder with them. So he wants their trust. He, he doesn't want them to rely on material goods. He wants them to from start to finish to know, I, I gave you this city. I will give you all the other cities as well. One of the other teaching items, numbers in the Bible. Numbers, you know, we find numbers repeating themselves over and over for different reasons. Um, number 12, for example, is typically a number of completeness. You have 12 disciples, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. Here we see seven, seven over and over again, and, and seven is a number that God uses for himself. So we see the seven times marching around, and the seventh time the, the walls fell. And the ruins of Jericho, kind of a modern archaeology point, the ruins of Jericho have been found. One of the, the things that you know, really points to the accuracy of Scripture, the historicity, is that they found these massive grain stores that were destroyed. You know, it wasn't like they were eaten through, or they worked through them, and then the people inside died of starvation. Uh, as they look through these ruins, it has every appearance that there was these massive stores of food and everything just collapsed in. So, you know, that's not something we need as Christians, that we look to historical or scientific proof and say, okay, see, there, we believe. But it's a nice thing when history confirms what the Bible says. And hopefully as we're talking with someone that has their doubts, that uh, can be something that kind of helps us keep the conversation going to say, look, there's things in this world that you can look at with your rational human brain and see, okay, that is accurate. And finally, I can't emphasize it enough, the last thing, the Lord fought the battle for Israel, uh, not Israel's power or might, and apply that truth to our lives. We have a lot of gifts from God, a lot of talents and abilities that we have, but it's He who made us, and we are His, and He fights our battles. And with God on our side, if God is for us, who can stand against us? We fall back in His grace and we trust and rely on Him. And that is absolutely where we need to be. God bless your lesson this weekend. Thank you.